twist it. Twist it like a Polaroid twister. I don't know. That was terrible. Happy Casual Wine Geek Wednesday. <laughs> Happy Wines Day. <laughs> I've been, um, I was putting away. Hi, Brandon. Oh, hi. Uh, that's Amanda. I'm Brandon. Who are we? Casual Wine Geek. What are we doing? Always take two bottles. Um, always. The sun came out today and I just don't know what to do with myself. We're giddy and drinking. It's, it's so funny how in this town when it, you know, I it's mean, granted drug. it was nice the other day. Yeah. I got a little sunburned. Um, Sun comes out in Seattle, like in and Portland. the mood in the city changes. Yeah, I mean, even I love springtime. I love springtime in the Pacific Northwest because the ugly ass branches that are outside now have tiny little fluorescent green buds. Yes, everywhere. Right? Yeah. new new things, new growth, and it, it smells so good when I can actually smell and I'm not dying because of um, <laughs> because of allergies. Because my allergies and the trees around me are trying to kill it, me. It hasn't bloomed yet, which. Something was blooming last week, and I got a oh, terrible sinus infection. Wow. It was unattractive and not cute. I poured you some more wine. I know. Thanks. What are we talking about today? Um, Don't call me Shirley. I, I mean, mean, Sherry. Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talking about Sherry today. Uh, yeah, we were inspired from our Canada trip. Uh-huh. Um, so we were at the Vancouver International Wine Festival. Hi, friends that we made hey. in Canada. Um, you all were amazing. Um, hey, girl. We're going to go and stay. Yeah, man. <laughs> We stayed at a great hotel. We met amazing people. We had some really awesome food. We drank some really good wine. Yeah, amazing wine. We had some good beers. Yeah. Which was funny because there was one night where we went out to a pub because we just wanted... <laughs> um, pub food. Pub food. Yeah. Super low key. It was a little... Um, it was busy. Yeah, it was... Everywhere we went was... Packed out. Or closed because I... <laughs> Don't do <laughs> correct research when I'm in a foreign country. You know what? It's totally fine. I, we like adventure. It's how you really get to walk around and see a town, get a good feel for the vibe. Yeah. Well, yes. Yes, we walked in circles. <laughs> but we found a pub. We did. We had and, some uh, beer. It was funny how when we sat down, we were like, oh, we're here for the wine festival. You know, we're in the industry, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And the bartender was like, oh, that's so funny. Someone else said the same thing earlier. Yeah. Like, I just want beer. I just I've want a beer. I've had so much wine. Yeah. I just want a beer. I just want a beer. Yeah, um, that was a great day. Yeah. And then, then that gentleman sat down next to us and mm -hmm. he was also at the festival. Yep. I think he was working. I think he was with a winery. Yeah. Because he looked real rough. He looked, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he had just had a really hard day. Uh-huh. Yeah. But it was funny how it's like, I feel like a lot of... When I was working in the beer industry, there were some people who kind of raised their eyebrows when I got this job at mm -hmm. this fancy beer bar. I firmly believe that when you can talk intelligently about one alcoholic beverage, you can kind of talk intelligently about them all. A lot of the yeah. words are interchangeable. Yeah. A lot of the descriptions for craft beer and wine are similar in terms of body and texture and finish and all the things. And you can take that even a step further and talk about distilled beverages like whiskey is distilled from beer. Cognac is distilled from champagne, right. right? Like, right. you can take the wine conversation just a little bit farther. Well, with alcohol. And, and you know, to tie it into what we're talking about today with sherry, sherry. there's a huge. <laughs> um, when you're done with sherry casks, they get yeah. shipped to Scotland to make scotch. Yeah, you make whiskey yeah. with sherry casks. And I think they're starting to do it with port. I know that Woodenville Whiskey up in Woodenville mm -hmm. and Westland Distillery here in Seattle. Seattle right. Uh, both use either sherry casts or port casts uh, to finish their whiskey. Yep, and it's, and it's so good. Yeah, it's it's um, lends another another level of flavor, I think. Yeah. But so it's funny how many people in in the beer industry think that all of us in the wine industry don't ever drink beer. <laughs> we love beer, but <laughs> it's low alcohol. It's like yeasty. It it's a, it's a just a different flavor and a yeah. different texture than wine has. I feel like it's, you know, a part of it, I think, is why a lot of times you'll have sparkling wine in between courses or, oh yeah, you know, to clean mm -hmm. your palate out because it's that it's those bubbles yeah. that really help in beer is carbonated, you know. And you know what? This is a um, segue, segue, segue. But we did uh, two special episodes you can find on patreon on uh we did a pumpkin beer episode and then we did a seasonal like christmas beer christmas beer yeah yeah, like yeah. jubilee yule time mm -hmm. beers episodes and you can find those on patreon so if you're a patreon member you can look up old things oh yeah let's talk about page can we do some business oh yeah let's, let's do talk housekeeping business. house business for mere mom just hold with us friends it's <laughs> all important right you sharing. definitely <laughs> want to pay attention to this bit because there is some important information yes so Patreon is the site that we use that you can sign up and you can help support this podcast. You can support it for as little as a dollar an episode. We really appreciate it. 
It'll, it keeps us running. It keeps us running. It keeps equipment. You know, we got to get some new equipment. It keeps, you know, just kind of the things happening. And Patreon members have an amazing opportunity. Uh, well, they get a they get a swag bag. Let's just call it what it is. Yeah, it's it's like the casual wine geek starter kit. That's right. It is the starter mm-hmm. kit. Yeah, it has some really. This brain never stops. <laughs> First of all, it comes in a gold wine purse. <laughs> we um. So this is the only the only thing that we'll will tell you. Yeah, it's sort of indulgent, and I um, love it so much. We were we really wanted to do um bags for bottles, and yeah. we wanted a two compartment because you know we always take two bottles. Yeah. Uh, and we were flipping through um, our options, and I have a dear, dear love of Gold Lame. Yeah, it, as it anyone is... should, absolutely. <laughs> dear, dear love of Gold Lame, <laughs> and so we have Gold Lame wine bags. Yeah, <laughs> oh it's, my god, it's amazing. There's some really amazing stuff. And, so, and they're they're chock full of presents. Presents for our Patreon members. Uh, Sign up now. You can do it through our website, www.casualwinegeeks.com. There's a little Patreon link. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to follow. Very easy to follow. And this is for Patreon people, but also for everyone. We are going to do a very, very special Mimosa Meet and Greet event. Yep. We're going to give you the date, May 6th. But you have to email us if you want to go because you get all the rest of the information. Yep. Uh, It is going to be so much fun and it is going to be <laughs> wear your easter best yeah it's although it's two easter months best. after easter so wear your spring um spring formal event in yeah, the morning it's, it's going to be it's a spring midday. brunch event you know this will not be a 5 p.m cocktail affair you don't no, need no. to wear your your dinner jewels Mm-mm. this was born from the spring brunch of brunchathon episode mm-hmm. yeah. and we wanted to have a mimosa meet and greet yep 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 so come and hang out with us. Yeah. Uh, info at casualwinegeeks.com. First 20. First 19. 20. 20 people now. 20 people, yeah. Yep. The tickets are going fast, and I will send you more information if you have already emailed there me. There might be a treasure map. <laughs> Thank you. If you've already emailed me, you are on the list. I will send you also confirmations as we get closer. Yep. It's going to be awesome. Speaking of Patreon. Tell me. One of our new members. Yes. Tyler. Hi, Tyler. Hi, Tyler. Sent a really cool update um, or a correction. A fluid fact check. A fluid fact check. We haven't done those in a long time. Well, I believe personally that um, (laughs) if someone calls you out on something that you should listen to them. Yeah. Because chances are you came at that information from the get go with a. A lot of enthusiasm, perhaps. And maybe not very good research. (laughs) But you're passionate about it. So we'll we'll just stay there. <laughs> yes, I'm passionate. Am I wrong sometimes? Maybe. Potentially. Um, so fluid fact check. So a while ago, I was talking about toasting, and um, Tyler sent us an email, and he was saying that I said that it you always have to drink when you toast, even if there's water in the glass. And then he found an interesting article yeah. about why you should never toast. With water in your glass. Oh, tell me. Well, so if you raise a glass of water during your toast, you will die by drowning. What? According to one particular tradition uh, within the U.S. Navy, huh. water toasts are considered bad luck. In the military, toasts are never drunk with liqueurs, soft drinks, or water. Um, tradition is that the object of the toast with water will die by drowning. <laughs> I don't want anyone... Please don't drown. Don't get drown. the dance. <laughs> I don't want anyone <laughs> to be cursed. I don't want yet. Yeah, nope. I don't want you to sleep with the fishes. I don't want you to wear any <laughs> cement booties. I'm not interested in that underwater look that sometimes <laughs> people get when right. they drown. I mean, come on. It's not very fetching. Uh, yeah. So Tyler, thank you. I would like to amend my previous statement and say, don't toast with water. <laughs> I don't want anyone to die. Maybe yeah. you're into the voodoo and the hoodoo and that's how you get your whatever. We have to give on, good but, advice. Yeah. Um, don't just don't like in our wine etiquette episode when I said you should kick people in the shins. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> In fact, it might be bad for you. Yeah, I just, I highly recommend maybe not listening to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tyler, thank you. Yes, yeah, so if you thank guys you, um, ever he- find a 
fun bit of information or or something that contradicts yeah. anything we say like please send it our way because it's a helpful because we're all learning together right mm-hmm. we're all yeah we're all in it together learning a thing and and you know i've said before and I'll we say just it again. happen to have microphones <laughs> yeah true coming at you coming at you from a mic yeah um yeah so i just uh wanted to say thanks and i appreciate that and don't toast with water we have wine to toast with uh, today. We do have wine to toast with today. Cheers. Oh, sorry. Was that a little loud? And that was with the bell and not the rim or the lip as you described it. As the lip. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, that's M-G. good. It's really good. We're talking about sherry today. Talking about sherry today. All right. Are we done with business? Yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think so. Perfect. Let's, We're talking about sherry today. Um, move on to sherry. So sherry... When I was growing up, was always the cooking sherry. Yeah, can we talk about your preconceived notions of what sherry Absolutely. was? I would love, and then to we'll talk get into that. like yeah. let's break that yeah, yeah, down because yeah, yeah. so, I feel like that's a really common thing. Cooking sherry is not drinking sherry, and cooking sherry and drinking sherry is not always sweet. That was my second introduction to sherry. Was right, super sweet. Right now, is drinking sherry cooking sherry? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. But cooking sherry is not drinking sherry. I would not recommend it. <laughs> I would not please suggest don't, it. Please don't do that. <laughs> Take it from us. Please don't do well, that. Well, it's also if you ever in the grocery store and you see something labeled cooking wine. Don't do that. You can't drink it because it's, I think it's above at least 5% salinity. It's got a real high salt content. So Ugh. it's not going to. It's not good for you. It's not for drinking. Don't drink it. Like I don't even think you could actually drink it because it's so salty. It might Ugh, make you sick. Gross. Or it's like vinegary more than... Anyway, just don't do it. So today we're talking about sherry. <laughs> My second introduction to sherry was the super, super sweet Pedro Jimenez sherry. Right. And I didn't particularly enjoy it. How old were you? I was much younger. Like seven? <laughs> Twelve? <laughs> this is why I love you, because time is so relative. <laughs> uh, I was probably late teens, Okay. Yeah. So is it one of those, like, you found a bottle of sherry in the back of mom and dad's cupboard? No, I tasted it at a dinner, I think. Oh. Yeah. And it just, I'm not a sweet person. That's because you're sweet now. <laughs> I crave salty yeah, and dry. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, which leads us into the very first sherry for today, which is salty and dry. Yeah, it's very common for, so this is a fino. So we're going to start at the lightest and then move to the deepest. And I've got information on what, we'll talk about what is sherry. I've mm-hmm. got some fun facts. Mm-hmm. Some of them are fluid. Some of them are not. <laughs> and um, all of our notes, all of your research, the notes go on Patreon. Mm-hmm. With links to all of the spots that I get my research from. Because I'm a big fan of citing your sources. Cite your sources. Nice work. Also, don't sue me. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so... This is a fino, which is the what's, l- what's sherry? Do you have a sh- do you have a general like? Well, what is okay, so I only ever heard of sherry growing up in terms of a cream sherry. Oh yeah, the sweeter ones, which I thought had cream in it, and so the it first time I've ever saw it, yeah, I was like, well, why? What? What? It's supposed to be creamy. Like I, I thought. It was like a Kahlua type. Or Bailey's, because yeah. we always had a bottle of Bailey's at Grandma's house. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. I mean, Put it in your coffee. God bless her. <laughs> so I don't have to. Um, <laughs> uh, so I always, th- I always thought it was it was a liqueur. I didn't know it was wine. Mm-hmm. Um, so sherry is wine that has distilled spirits in it. So very similar to port. Is it added spirits? It is added spirits. Okay. Um, grape spirits. So they're neutral. They're It's similar to maybe how you'd make cognac before you do mm-hmm. the fun, fancy stuff to it, right? So mm-hmm. it's just grapes that have been distilled mm-hmm. and not fermented. Those are two different types different of ways. making alcohol, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Um, it is fortified from the Andalusia part of southern Spain. So fortified just means they've added this distilled... Mm-hmm. Um, spirit spirit yep. to the yep. to the original like thing like port yep. mm-hmm. okay um it is not always sweet it is really runs the gambit i you know from like this fino is dry and salty and and it has a weight to your mouth mm-hmm. it's very creamy on the palate but not creamy as a wine 
It's very like velvety on the palate. It's very smooth. It's mm-hmm. not harsh. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes really it's well. It's not biting. With salted Marcona almonds with a little oh, bit of rosemary. Like we have right in front of us. <laughs> it also goes well with like a um, sardine tapas. Yeah. Like a, a salted fish. And yeah. the more intense in sherry you get like when you get to a amontillado or a oloroso you they're much darker and much deeper and we'll talk about why but they're best served with food they're not very necessarily right. good by themselves yeah um so you know you and i i think both had sort of this preconceived notion that sherry is always sweet yeah and mm-hmm. fun fact not always sweet not always sweet fino uh, is is some of my favorite wine it is so good yeah and it's because it's, cause it's it's dry and not sweet at all. <laughs> right. Well, so one of the reasons that we as Americans kind of have this preconceived notion is that we tend to like things on the sugary side. We mm-hmm. like soda. We like yep. really sweet Rieslings. We sweet like tea. really sweet Gewürztraminers, right? Yep. We, we enjoy wine. a mm-hmm. sweeter beverage. Mm-hmm. Well, that sort of, you know, we talked about Lambrusco, right? Yeah, sweet, sweet Lambrusco. Sparkly. Yep. White Zinfandel, mm-hmm. right? Time and place. <laughs> But even a lot of the red wines that are sold in the market, right? It, it's a very large percentage of the red wines that are sold in the market today are a red blend that is very sweet. Yeah, that's what we like. Yeah, you as know. Americans in general. Quesera, Shiraz. <laughs> that's an episode later. <laughs> yeah, well, so because we tend to like things a lot sweeter, um, at least in the mid-20th century, the market got flooded with a lot of these sweet things because Spain and Britain and there's a big relationship between Spain and Britain in terms of sherry consumption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, They kept all the dry good stuff because it wouldn't sell over here. Mm -hmm. And it's what they've been drinking there for literally thousands of years. Yeah. Um, So there's different styles and shapes. And as we open each bottle, or should we talk about them all at once? Let's talk no. about them all at once. No, no, no. Let's talk about them when we open them because then we can give tasting notes. Okay. So Fino, which is the first one we're drinking, is yep. the driest, most saline style. Yep. Finos are generally made from a real high acid grape called Palomino, um, which they grow in these real, real chalky white soils called abaritzas. Um so they get tank fermented, uh, which means that we're fermenting them in a tank and not a barrel. Mm-hmm. They it, spend the entire time under a blanket of yeast that we call flor, uh, which keeps the wine from oxidizing. So it's so dense that it it's the oxygen can't penetrate this little into the, real thick layer yeah. of yeast that protects the wine. So it's like it's like uh, a champagne laying on the lees, like like. like similar but not in the barrel it's not mixed up yeah it's not in the barrel it floats on the top of the wine right and so it's not so it still has that like heavier mouth feel from that contact it is it is pretty dense yeah but it is not but it keeps oxygen out so it doesn't oxidize which we'll talk about that later because there is a style of sherry where the yeast is broken up and mixed in and then a style where there is no yeast at all and it's purposefully oxidized. Yeah. And if you call it sherry, it has to come from Jerez. Jerez or well, so there's three areas in this area of Spain. I've got a real nice map. Hold on. Fino, you should eat with seafood, salty snacks. People told me when I started drinking wine that it's an acquired taste and I actually prefer it. Fino. Wait, really? Yeah. People said it was acquired? It was an acquired taste because of the texture. Mm, those people are wrong. Yeah. Well, fluid facts. Well, or they're not wrong, and I'm wrong. It's <laughs> quite a possibility. Um, all right. So in Andalusia, which is the very south of Spain, where Malaga, Jerez, Cadiz, uh, San Lucar, the Barameda, and Hueleva um, are all this area in it's very similar to champagne where you cannot have champagne outside champagne, right? So you yep. cannot have sherry outside of this area. Outside of this area. Yep. They're a lot less lax than the champagne board is about running around the world and shaking a finger and filing lawsuits. But if you're buying sherry, you should take a look at the bottle and just make sure that it comes from this area. Yep. Support yep, yep, the yep. people that have made it what it is, right? Yep. Absolutely. Okay. You know, a lot of in people who are intim- imitating, not intimidating, 
imitating people who are imitating um this style of beverage try and replicate this like salty nutty aromatic thing Mm -hmm. and you really it's it's this real special place in the world and it just doesn't it just doesn't taste the same if it comes from somewhere else yeah that's true you know there's more to a bottle than the liquid that's inside it it's Terroir. the wind it's yeah. the soil it's yeah. the sun it's, it's the people the people yeah. it's what you age things in like yep. it's there's so much that goes into it and it's just like being able to tell the difference between a champagne and a sparkling from lua oregon south africa right yeah everything is so different in these different places the climate is different so of course you're going to be able to tell the difference you're going to be able to taste the difference if you had it side by side right yeah well and so we should maybe talk about alcohol content real quick oh sure so sherry's because they're fortified and they have Mm -hmm. spirits in them they're boozy they're boozy 15 to 20 percent but if you look at a Zinfandel from California in a really hot year, they can run up to 16%. Now, you have to be careful in the States when your alcohol content gets too high because then you get labeled a dessert wine. That's true. And you pay different taxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fun fact. (laughs) The TTB. They're they're taxed. Dessert wines are taxed differently than Mm -hmm. non-dessert wines. So when your alcohol gets to be a certain level, you just automatically get put in this category. So in the States, we tend to have a problem and we try and keep things at a certain level. Um, But, I mean, it's also serving size-wise, you're not drinking drinking five and a half ounces of sherry. You're drinking three ounces of sherry. Right. Or an ounce of sherry. Right. It's it's, um, really good as an aperitif. It's really good as a digestif after dinner. If you're, you know, an oloroso or an amontillado or even a cream sherry you can have with a cup of coffee, you know, or an espresso. Or a cake. Or a cake. No cakes. Just kidding. No capes. Um. Yeah, so in terms of types, um, oh my gosh. Fino and Manzanilla are the two lightest types of sherry. You can age them f- between two and ten years in the Solera system, which we'll talk about how sherry is made because it's it serves sure. a system. Um, but when they're bottled, they're meant to be consumed right away. So they're really good with olives, almonds, oh, yeah. salty, fishy, delicious tapas. So you the know. first one is a fino, it's the most dry. The second one is a manzanilla. Mm-hmm. I poured you a little bit so you can taste it side by side. Wait, where? Right here. Oh, I was looking in the empty glass. I'm like, <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> I have cute little sherry glasses. There which is I enc- nothing in that glass. I encourage everybody to get cute well, little and sherry glasses. When I was doing research, I actually <laughs> did find a thing that said you shouldn't necessarily always drink sherry out of something this small. A white wine glass is much better if you're more interested in aromas. Okay. Right, because if you think about how white wine, yeah, like these, like they trap, mm-hmm. there's that little that little trap of um, that pocket, right, that can, you know, hold on to a lot of those aromas, mm-hmm. stick mm-hmm. your nose in there and give it a good... That's why you put champagne whiff. in a burgundy glass. Yes. All right, so this is the manzanilla? Man- yeah, this is the manzanilla. It smells so different from the Fino. And I sh- we should give a, a little shout out to the producer. We're doing four sherries from the same producer today, mm. so... Um, we could really taste the difference in the same area, the same producer, the same winemaking style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I wanted to be able to compare oh, God, all that's so good. <laughs> all four sherries that we were drinking today. Um, La Stelle. Yeah, which I feel like when you guys see the photo that we put up, you'll yeah. absolutely recognize the label. Yeah, yeah. They do a lot of sherry and we saw them in Vancouver. Yeah, and lovely, lovely people. Yeah, delightful. Lovely people. So... Okay. Finos are tank fermented white wines that spend their ex- entire existence um, under this blanket of yeast that we've talked about, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, they tend to be 15 to 16 percent alcohol and are best served chilled. Um, I definitely recommend serving both of these cold. Yeah. Really good with salty snacks like peanuts, potato chips, cured olives and fried seafood. You want to you want to pony up some fried oysters? Done. One of the best pairings ever. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah. Fried oysters. Pan fry some oysters. This would be amazing. I wonder if Taylor Shellfish serves sherry. Well, you know what? We're gonna ask. <laughs> Let's ask our friends at Taylor Shellfish. <laughs> Hi, Taylor Shellfish. Um, okay, so moving on to Manzanilla, which are a little bit more flinty and are essentially finos, but they're made in the coastal town of San Lucar, the Barameda. 
um, which is, where did my map go? They have a little bit, Fino is very dry and very salty. This is not sweeter, but a little bit more round on the edges. It's got a little bit more of that nutty flavor. It's got a little bit more. It tastes a little boozy. It tastes a little boozy, but it's rounder. Compared, yeah, compared yeah, yeah, yeah. to the compared. other one. But it's rounder on the edges. Like the acid's a little bit more round. It it's almost, a little bit sweeter, but not sweet. It almost tastes like hazelnuts that haven't been toasted. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. raw hazelnuts. It's yep. got it's got it's got yeah. a real meaty density to it. It's like the liquid in the hazelnuts. You know when you crack open a fresh yeah. filbert. Oh, you know, Oregon hazelnuts. World famous. <laughs> I'm They're familiar. So good. With the oil on the inside. Mm-hmm, oh, God. Mm-hmm. So San Lucar, the Barameda, is on the Atlantic side of Spain. So where Morocco and the Strait of Gibraltar, um, right, the Strait of Gibraltar cuts mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Spain mm-hmm. from Africa and leads you into the Mediterranean. Um, Jerez, uh, which is south of San Lucar, like they're... Um, they're just right in that. Yeah, same they're right where uh, sort of where Portugal meets the bottom of Spain if you just go in the little swoop a little bit. Yep. Did you get that map off of Wine Folly? I did. We love Wine Folly. Their maps are awesome. Thank you. I'm a visual learner. <laughs> <laughs> They're they, very helpful. Yeah, they have great content. I'm really impressed with all the all the stuff that they put out yep. that is really helpful for geeks like us. Faux show. Okay, so Manzanilla mm-hmm. comes from the coastal town of San Lucar. Um, so similar to Fino's... They are made with the same winemaking techniques. So you've with got, the floor, mm-hmm, you've got aging, you've got floor. Uh, it really helps preserve the freshness and salinity. So these wines are supposed to be kind of salty. Yeah, floor is F L O R. Yeah, F L O R. Yeah, and it is on the top, not on the bottom. Again, because these are both the lightest types of sherry, mm-hmm. they're really, really good with seafood. Oh God! Yeah. Like super high. I recommend it. Little toasted uh, baguette with a little like avocado schmear and a salty sardine on the top with a with a sherry. You got that creamy. So good. You've got that salty. Oh, God, you've got that so crunchy. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's it's a little party in your mouth. It is a party in your mouth, and it's easy to make at home. Yeah, I don't dig sardines. They're not my not my go to snack. But hey, I'm not here to judge. <laughs> but you'll take a an lot. avocado toast with salt and pepper on it with a fino like this, and it would be delicious. I would want something else on top of it. Like a protein? Yeah, maybe a maybe a calamari thing. Oh yeah, you could calamari. I forgot that you do like calamari. Oh, I love me a squid. <laughs> Octopus. <laughs> pulpo. <laughs> pulpo. Yeah. Go that direction if you want if you want. These are really great with green olives. Like a, mm-hmm. those herbed olive mm-hmm. dishes. Yeah. I oh god. Mm. Oh, it's god. so oh, good, sherry. isn't it? Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Don't. Trust us. Trust us. <laughs> I mean, I, us. I really dig a salty snack, so this is yeah. right up my alley. Okay, well, let's talk about Flor okay. for a minute, which is this yeasty situation. So in winemaking, we refer to this, it's it's almost like a film of yeast on the surface of the wine, which it is... It's what, like an inch, inch and a half thick? I wouldn't even say it's even that thick. Oh, really? Mm-mm. Like a half an inch thick? I would say maybe half an inch. It's, I mean, in looking at the photos, it seems pretty, right? Like that doesn't, that's not a really... Oh yeah, that's not big at all. Mm-mm. And surprising how it incorporates with the wine to keep the wine from oxidizing. Like it's a really fascinating little microcosm you've got going on. you got a whole there's, world of... You know, there's a th- maybe a fourth of the barrel headspace that's left open. Mm-hmm. And then this little layer of floor and then your sherry underneath it. It's it's so amazing because it's so different from a regular winemaking technique. Because normally you would keep you know that air out. Yeah, you're in a you're in a, a oxygen free environment. But in sherry production, you're only filling the barrels up f- mm, like two thirds, two right? thirds, yeah, five sixths, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, full with this wine, so that you leave. And they quote this as saying the space of two fists empty to allow the floor yeast to take form and the bung which is the the hole in yep. the barrel yep where the little plug goes mm-hmm. they don't seal it completely because you oh. need that you need the ability for the active yeasts to get in and start doing their thing is it before or after they um fortify oh that's a really good question we'll talk about that 
in a minute. In a minute. Okay. Mere minutes. Mere minutes. Um, stay with us. Stay. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> don't skip ahead. So, yeah, we're bringing this to you ad free. <laughs> I, I feel like even, I should have a commercial break. I totally and thought stay with and us. <laughs> after this break. Um, well, okay. So the floor <laughs> favors cooler climates with higher humidity. So sherry's produced in the coastal San Lucar area or El Puerto de Santa Maria um, have a thicker cap. So the cap can change depending on the humidity outside in terms oh. of density. And the cap, it, the cap that you're talking about is the floor. Is the floor, right. Yep. So as opposed to those produced a little bit farther inland uh, near Jerez mm-hmm. will have a thinner cap. Okay. Got um, it. So this yeast gives the resulting sherry its distinct fresh taste with residual flavors of fresh bread. Depending on the development of the wine, it may be aged entirely under the veil of flor to produce a fina or manzanilla, which we're having right now, mm-hmm. or it may be fortified to limit the growth of flor and undergo oxidative aging to produce an amontillado or oloroso. Which we're going to have next. Correct. So the time of... You chose wisely. You chose wisely. <laughs> Huzzah! Um, so during the process of fermentation with mm-hmm. sherry the floor yeast works anaerobically which we've talked about previously in terms of converting sugar into ethanol and then when the sugar has been consumed the physiology of the yeast changes to where the anaerobic process of breaking down and converting the acids into the compounds like I feel like I should know how to pronounce that and I don't anyway moving on <laughs> read the notes um, there's a link Patreon. Um you know, this waxing, a waxy coating appears on the cell's exterior, causing the yeast to float to the surface and form a protective blanket, enough to shield the wine from oxygen. And it creates the floor. Mm-hmm. So this process drastically lowers the acidity of the wine, making sherry one of the most aldehydic wines in the world. Studies have shown that the floor for the th- floor to thrive... The wine must stay in a narrow alcohol range of 14.5 to 16% ABV. Below 14.5, the yeast will not form this protective cap, and so the wine will oxidize to the point of becoming vinegar. How we get vinegar. How we get the sherry vinegar, Mm -hmm. the sherry, cooking sherry. Yep. 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 So above 16%, the floor also cannot survive, and the wine essentially becomes oloroso. Oh. So we're drinking young baby oloroso. If it if the alcohol gets too likely high. not when they started the process they already have dictated what is going to become what based on oh, the harvest they've chosen it based on the grapes mm-hmm. or what and there's you. a whole there's a whole system of ticking chuck on the side of barrels like if it's one slash it means this thing if it's one slash and a dot it means this thing if it's two slashes it's going into this wow that's style amazing. yeah it's really really it can sherry unsurprisingly is very can be very complicated and yeah. really really intimidating there's a lot of information and i barely scratched the surface with the stuff that i'm bringing today can we go there you, you'll add it to the list okay <laughs> <laughs> fucking casual add wine geeks the- <laughs> world tour <laughs> it's just so amazing and i it's like when we were talking about going and bidding uh, visiting a cooper like how they make the barrels every episode that we we start researching and talking about I'm like I want to go there I want to ask them so many questions I have questions I want them answered oh sidebar <laughs> um, I was talking to someone who knows someone in Oregon who makes amphora what yeah well we need to go to Oregon mm-hmm. business trip business trip can we take can we take the men folk sure we okay. can do whatever we, need, we want we need someone to carry our cases wine <laughs> 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 no one tell my husband that I said that shh <laughs> Maybe we'll bring Douglas and we'll get him a little oh, cart. Douglas the wine. Dog. And he can he can be like a little a little hush puppy and I need to see more of Douglas. Carry. The world needs to see more of Douglas. Oh, he's gonna get a haircut this week. The kitten's got a haircut. Oh goodness, they're so cute. <laughs> they're so cute. Uh, can I pour you the next little deliciousness? Oh yes, please do. Is this the Amontillado? It is, in fact. Um, the first two had a screw top. This one has an actual cork. Did you ever read The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe? I did not. It's not a very good... It's not my favorite of his work. Really? But that was the first place I ever heard of Amontillado. And actually, I was thinking about this recently. Um, 
because of because when I was thinking about like what are some of the things that preconceived notions I had of Sherry, I didn't know what Amontillado was. Yeah. And so when I read it, I feel like I read this story when I was probably 12. I was going to say, I bet you were what, sixth grade, fifth grade? Uh, seventh grade? Maybe seventh grade. Seventh grade? I was in middle school. I was yeah. that weirdo. Well, because Edgar Allan Poe is always a great thing to read in middle school. Well, you're <laughs> dark and tortured and no one understands you. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, we get it. Your hormones, they're terrible. We've all been there. Stop it. I wouldn't want to go back. Not even if you paid me. <laughs> Not yeah. even if you paid me. Well, so oh. when I was thinking about Amontillado and and reading this story and not really understanding what was a cask and what is Amontillado and because my parents didn't drink and you're in middle school and no one wants to help you do research on alcohol. Right. Corrupt your precious little mind. Don't. Too late. Don't talk about <laughs> it. This smells like a Werther's. <laughs> it's got that butterscotch oh it just gets you right oh oh god that's delicious well okay so to finish this sidebar mm-hmm. um you know no one really ever explained me what amontillado is well then did you ever read the golden compass by philip pullman nope i highly recommend it it's a delightful delightful book it's a series of books. He's, I need he's a moment. A very good author. Um, <laughs> Tell me a story. I need a moment with this wine. Well, at the be- at the beginning, <laughs> someone breaks a decanter of Tokai. I again had to ask my dad, "What's a decanter? What's Tokai?" Did he tell you? He pretty much said a decanter is something that you put wine in. Tokai is a type of wine, and kind of left it at that. And because we didn't drink, so there wasn't a lot of information about. Right, and we talked about the Encyclopedia Britannica that you would have had to reference. Yes. <laughs> All right. 29 fucking books, because yeah. some letters had extra books. S had two books. But didn't they, didn't they combine, like, X and Z? Yeah, but, but like, or M XYZ had... XYZ was its own. XYZ was its own. S had two. I think M had two. There was one, one letter that had three. It was... T, yeah. maybe? Maybe. It was amazing. Anyway. Sidebar. Over. <laughs> oh my gosh. This wine is amazing. Well, this is an Amontillado. Yes. So. This wine is amazing. Based on how sherry gets made, there's no guarantee that the floor will hold. Um, and so in cases where it doesn't, you get an Amontillado. Now it gets, it's, it's real brown. Um, it's much darker in color. It's real caramely. It almost looks like it's been artificially colored. Yeah, almost. Which fake sherries will do. Like yeah. they'll add they'll add oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. food they're, coloring uh, if yeah, they're yeah, not yeah. real sherry. Yeah. But they this this tastes like a Werther's and then with the Marcona almonds, it just like explodes yeah, in your it's mouth. It's crazy. It is so the good. flavors of sherry are It's so good. Yeah. It's really great. So it gets this brown hue and color because it's got extended contact with the air on the inside of the Solera barrels. Mm -hmm. Now the result rather than crispy, salty deliciousness of a Manzanilla or a Fino, you get this really sort of more oxidized, nutty, almost mushroomy, Mm -hmm. really umami, deep, deep flavor. Generally, they're about 18% ABV, Mm -hmm. um, but they're really good for medium bodied soups or um, pheasant, duck, or uh, flavorfully sauced pork. Pheasant with this would be amazing. I'm sorry, not duck, rabbit. Oh, yeah, rabbit for sure. Pheasant with this would be amazing, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of, okay, so let's talk about Solaris for a minute. Sure. Can I pour the last one just in your little happy little yes, my sherry happy glass? little sherry glass? So Solera's. So let's talk about Solera's. So, Laris. Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon. Yes, ma'am. Can we talk about Solera's? Hey, let's do it because they are a integral part of how this product gets made. Yeah, this is the this is how this is how it happens. All right. So, walk me through it, everybody. Hold on. Put your socks on. Well, yes, because I'm about to maybe blow them off. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Buy Absolutely. me a drink first. Um, <laughs> that's a different podcast. That's not us. Oh. <laughs> is that the us. late night? Is that yeah. the late night that's podcast? Late night. <laughs> yeah. That's not us. That's another podcast. Inappropriate. There are children listening. Yeah. Solaris. 
Um, okay, so imagine you've got, let's say, four rows of barrels stacked on top of each other. So let's say four barrels and four rows. So you have 16 barrels. 16 barrels. Four on the bottom. Four on the bottom. Four in the middle, low. Four, four in, in the, the middle, middle high, high. And then four on the top. Four on the top. Okay. Okay, let me dial it back because this is where things can get a little confusing and or frustrating. But we still have 16 barrels. We still have 16 barrels. Okay. All that right. has not changed. This is a, <laughs> this is a story problem. In our problem. hypothetical <laughs> bodega where we're making sherry, we still have 16 barrels. This is, right. This we're is not a, producing a lot of sherry. This is a story um, problem that I don't know if I want to participate in. Yes. Okay. So barrels in a solera okay. are arranged into different groups or tiers that are called criaderas, mm-hmm. um, or which is also nursery. Um, so each scale, uh, each layer, layer they called they're called scales. So each set of four that are a horizontal set of four, right? In the our bottom. bodega, yes, okay. it's a horizontal set of four. In some bodegas, no, more or less, more, much like more. Your entire what we would have as our top layer would be its own entire building. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. Right. So based on your amount of production. Yep. Okay. All right. So. Each scale, so each level, Mm -hmm. has wine of the same age. So the oldest scale or level, confusingly also called a solera, has the wine that's about to be bottled. So and that's on the the bottom. bottom. Okay, and then the newest stuff is on the top. On the top. Okay. So you take a fraction of the wine out of the solera. This process is called saca. Out of the out, out of, of the, the bottom, bottom. Right, because we're talking about the... So this, the oldest, this is why it's important to sometimes have a visual, which I'll put these up <laughs> for folks so to see. So if you have four layers of four barrels, the bottom... Where you're bottling from, where you're where drawing you're the liquid yep. to put in the bottles. That is that is also called a solera. Confusing. Super confusing. And That's why I was like, this is where it gets a little wonky. And the top <laughs> is the new liquid that goes in. Yes, and that is referred to as the sobre tablas. Oh, the top of the table. Mm-hmm. And then you have the second criadera, mm-hmm. and then the first criadera, and then the solera. So okay. top to bottom, you've got sobre tablas, second criadera, first criadera, solera. Is everybody with me? I'm with you. Perfect. So, <laughs> buttons. <laughs> when we take wine from the bottom row... The solera, bottle. the solera. Let's say you take out enough to make one case. Uh huh. Okay. Out of the bottom row of four mm-hmm. barrels. Okay. You replace that amount. Yes. From the first criadera, which into is into the bottom row. From the second criadera, you replace that same amount into the first criadera. From that criadera, you replace that space with the sobre tablas from the top. So you're taking... You're fractionally filling yep. all the way down to uh-huh. the bottom. Okay. Yep. I'm with you. So, that was easy. Yeah. You bottle from the bottom. You fractionally fill from the top. From New, the top. Newest stuff comes in the top. Right. So and newest, it's only four layers. From the top layer, you're only filling the layer below it. From the layer below it, you're only filling the right. layer below it. Right. Yep. So, you're, so you're not... Right. Okay. So I, I should it. not try and overcomplicate no, this because no, no. it Don't was make, a little complicated. No, no, no. Make it easy. You fractionally fractionally fill from the top. Right. And this is why it helps me to have a visual aid. <laughs> <laughs> the new stuff goes in the top. The stuff ready to be bottled it goes from the bottom and it ages as it moves through the system top to bottom. Yes. Fractionally filling. So you're so if you have a Solera going from 1500, technically, maybe there's a fraction of that wine that you're drinking today that was from the 1500. Get yeah, no, because the oldest producers of sherry, the oldest bodega, I think, is from the 1700s. Okay, 1700s, but you get I did the point. Research. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you get the you get the point. You could yeah, have yeah, yeah. a fraction of the sherry that you're drinking. From. It's like when you go to McDonald's and you get that McFlurry. Chances are, some well, of that liquid has been in there for a really, really long time. I wasn't going to say that. I was going to say if you go to San Francisco to the sourdough bread place. Their starter is the oldest sourdough starter in the nation, and you could have sourdough bread that's... Will they give you some? You can buy it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a bread facility. They have the oldest sourdough starter in the nation in San Francisco. So they've kept that sourdough starter going for... 200 years or 150 years or however long. Is it delicious? 
oh yeah it's the best oh well it's the best of course it is <laughs> i mean okay sorry <laughs> that's okay <laughs> focus pay attention okay so you have a slayer system th- and the wine that is pulled out of the bottom of the slayer system is which wine all of the wines w- one of the wines all of them all of them. Yeah. So when you're so bottling, even a, even a fino goes mm-hmm. through the slur oh, yeah, system for sure. Okay. For sure. For sure. I just clarifying questions. Yeah. So um, this taking away part of the wine and replacing it with contents of another level or scale yeah. is called roquiar. Okay. Which means to wash down. Oh, wash down mm-hmm. or fractionally fill. Or fractionally fill. Um, I really enjoyed reading a lot of this because it's all in Spanish and that's a, that's a language I know how to pronounce <laughs> versus French, which is a language I do not know how to pronounce and get corrected all the time. I'm very impressed that you did your research in Spanish today. Well, I mean, but that's where this delightful beverage comes from. I know, but Google has a translate button, which I always press because I don't know a foreign language. I'm impressed with your ability to do it in your head. Oh, well, all of the all of the articles and stuff I read were in English. It's just oh. a lot of these terms are Spanish terms. Oh, I see. Does I that see, make I sense? See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, I, I was not reading articles in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I can just pronounce things. <laughs> Doing this... This replacing situation usually takes place a couple times a year. Okay. It's not once, uh-huh. um, although there are some places that only do it once. And they bottle stuff like is, spring, fall? Or every quarter. Okay. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Eh. Got it. Okay. I don't know. Um, is there vintage years in Sherry? Well, there used to be and not anymore. Because they have the Solera system and it's hard to do a vintage year. It's all, fraction, it's all fractionally blended. So yeah. it's... All right. I was just curious if you had come across that. I have not. There potentially could be, but I didn't see anything in my travels on the interwebs. Huh. The information superhighway, if you will. <laughs> zoom, zoom, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just wondering because perhaps there could be a like a particular year that the grapes were delicious and they just make a Solera system based on that one particular harvest, right? Oh, okay. So... Yes. Tying that in, yeah. so a saca, which is taking out part of the old wine, and a rocchio, which is replenishing the casks, take place takes place a couple times a year, mm-hmm. um, and that number can vary based on. Um, but specific figures are hardly ever disclosed because it's it's, it's you know like a, it's it's yeah. like a champagne house with how they blend because it's their house blend. Yeah, you, yeah. You, it's proprietary. It doesn't get yeah, you know absolutely written down on a post-it note and just, you know, <laughs> taped to a window. It's what they call institutional knowledge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For it's, sure. You know, the people that are working there understand a depth of the process that can't be written down. Well, and so it also, what plays a part in how often this happens is where you are. So in Jerez, mm-hmm. uh, a fino made in Jerez will usually get refreshed between two and four times a year. However, in San Lucar, the Barameda, um, because the floor has a higher acidic content, Mm -hmm. you know, let's say a manzanilla, for example, um, you know, can go through six to 10 replenishings a year. Right. So it depends on the acid content. It depends on where you are. It depends on how your wine was made. Mm -hmm. Like it's again, is one of those, like all the, that, that package that really dictates what, makes your beverage taste the way it tastes fascinating i did not know any of this before i started doing research (laughs) i love it so by law there is a maximum of 35 percent that can be taken out but normally it's only between 10 and 15 percent of the 500 to 550 liter capacity um to get taken out and refreshed a little bit less in manzanilla um solera's Mm -hmm. uh note that it is not common for wine to be drawn from all of the casks at the Solera at the same time, but usually spread out. So this system has been around for a really, really long time, and it's an interesting aging method. They thought, or they think, originated in San Lucar mm-hmm. um, in about the last decade of the 18th century. Mm-hmm. So before this, all sherries were bottled as añadas or vintages. Oh, okay. Um, right. Año in Spanish is year, year mm-hmm. right? So añadas, so things that are done yearly or have a year attached to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and this concept was still used quite a bit, actually, up until the 20th century. Uh, the first real aging consisted of blending statically aged wines of different ages, which at that point were called 
Vino Añejo, Trans Añejo, or Re Añejo. Each of these wines was given a numeric value roughly related to its average age. So it wasn't until the mid-19th century that the Solera system, as we know it Mm -hmm. today, started to get implemented with a lot more systematic refreshing, watering down. (laughs) Yeah? Yeah? Are you with me? I love it. Are you with me? (laughs) You're like like fingers and moving and yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I was hanging out with a girlfriend who was visiting from the East Coast not too long ago over the holidays, and she we hadn't seen each other in about five or six years, and she's like, I forgot how much you talk with your hands. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this podcast is good practice. Okay, um, so cheers. This is our last one. So this is the Oloroso? This is the Oloroso. Fruit. Oh, look at that color. It's so pretty. Clutching my pearls, swooning on the ground. It's very good. That is goddamn fucking delicious. Yeah, it's very good. I'm not going to apologize for swearing just then. <laughs> I've noticed we go back and forth on our podcasts about like we swear a lot and then the next podcast we're super proper. I was listening to the episode that <laughs> dropped today and I think that was the first thing I said to you when I came in was I swore a lot on that episode, huh? We were very passionate. Well, well, yeah, mm-hmm. We do not have a PG rating. No, it's explicit. Um, You're welcome. Okay, so fun fact, some of the oldest Solaris that are still in use are at Osborne, which... Uh, was laid down in 1790 wow. and Sibarita, uh, which was in 1792, El Maestro Sierra, which was in 1830, Valdespino, which was in 1842, and Gonzalez Bias, which was in 1847. So those are the oldest Soleras that are still in use. Still in use. Hand movement and all. <laughs> um, and so we, we just need to go there. We need to take a picture of it. We need to mm-hmm. like taste all the things. Oh yes, oh mm-hmm. yes. So you can have a different number of tiers in your Solera. Okay, it's, it's not limited to the four that we talked about earlier. Right? Oh, right, I just right, right. did that yeah. because that's what was on the photo that and I was it, looking at to reference. To explain, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. So the number of tiers um, between the bottom and the top can vary quite a lot depending on the style that you're making and the preference of the bodega Mm -hmm. in general manzanilla and fino soleras will have more of those middles than those of oloroso or oxidative sherries um in general will have less of like like a cream sherry a cream sherry would have less. a cream sherry you say (laughs) would a cream sherry have less yes okay uh, we didn't have a cream sherry today, but do you have any information on a cream sherry? Oh, I do have information on a cream sherry in terms of... Okay, so actually, let's talk about Oloroso first okay, since we sure. just poured it. Yeah. Um, so where Amontillado, which is what we had previous to this, is where the floor breaks up naturally mm-hmm. and is integrated into the wine. Mm-hmm. And Oloroso is purposefully done without that cap. But no floor. No floor. Um Oloroso, no floor. No floor. So the cellar master actually intentionally destroys it to promote oxidation. Olorosos can be very sweet um, or dry, depending on the type of grapes that are used. So let's talk about grapes for a minute because it makes a difference. This one is very dry. So an Oloroso can include Moscatel, which is sweet, Mm -hmm. or made from strictly Palomino, which is dry, like an Amontillado, uh, where the ABV is generally around 18 to 19%, Olorosos can withstand decades in barrels. Ah, oh, this one is very dry. I would imagine that this is Palomino. Does it say on the back? Mm-mm, it doesn't, but uh, it does say served at uh, These dry sherries have a genuine rich and nutty flavor. Yeah, agreed. Well, so the last group of sherries are cream or also known as Pedro Jimenez. Mm-hmm. Cream sherries come in a multitude of forms and quality levels. A basic cream sherry is more or less an Oloroso with sweet grapes like Pedro Jimenez or Moscatel blended in. In complex varietals, Pedro Jimenez and Moscatel-based sherries, the grapes are freshly picked and then sun-dried to concentrate those flavors. Out Similar to like Amarone, right? So On the mats, mm-hmm. right? Oh my God. That it, If you see pictures of these grapes just like out baking in the sun on these huge mats, yeah, it is amazing. It's really cool. It's really cool. It's amazing. Here's, um, this is the fun quote that I found. <laughs> these can be dark, unctuous wines with viscosity akin to motor oil. 
<laughs> Whoever wrote that gets the award this week. <laughs> they get the pretentious you wine fuck award. The word unctuous. <laughs> Um. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. Choices. There, here's your award. Maybe we'll send you a thesaurus. <laughs> Maybe not. I like the word unctuous actually. Or a gold wine purse. Well, okay. So I always thought the cream sherries, like I said earlier, had mm-hmm. cream in them or were a cream based beverage. Fun fact: not the case. Not the case. Did a little bit of wee research, and our friend Dr. Vinny. Oh yeah, from the Wine Spectator. Uh yes, Wine Spectator. That's correct. Okay. Um, someone asked them. We recently put some cream sherry on our list at the restaurant where I work. What makes it a quote unquote cream sherry? So Dr. Vinny responds with cream sherry actually doesn't have any dairy in it, but it's sweet and dark in the Oloroso style. How did it get its name? The story goes that a woman attending a sherry tasting in the late 1800s sampled a variety of traditional sherry, which was named Bristol's milk after the British seaport Bristol. Um, where sherry was routinely shipped. So after tasting the newer, sweeter, more unctuous, why does everybody use fucking unctuous? unctuous? (laughs) Um, And as yet named sherry, she declared, if that is milk, then this is cream. And thus the nickname stuck. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it it was referred to as Bristol's milk. So if that is milk, then this must be cream. And then it was referred to as cream Cream sherry. sherry. Yeah. That's super interesting. Thanks, Dr. Vinny. Yeah, it is recommended as an after-dinner drink served over ice or perhaps on the side with a cup of coffee. <laughs> hey, not mad about that. You know what? I'm not wearing any socks any- socks anymore, so I think today was a good day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you for all your research on Sherry today. Yeah, I also will, in, in all of this, put up a little, um, I have some lists of interesting fun facts about Sherry, some of which I just wanted to touch on real quick before we wrap up. All right. So Sherry comes from this area of Spain in the town of Jerez, or also spelled X-E-R-E-S. In uh, It used to be called, so this is where the term Sherry comes from, which okay. I thought would be a fun way to sort of tie it all up. Sure. Why do we call it Sherry? Why do we call it Sherry? Well, it used to be called Sherish during the 500-year-long Moorish occupation. This area was called oh. Sherish. Well, the, uh, the Moors, the Arab, the Muslim, like mm-hmm. Muslim? Yep. They actually came up with this idea of distilling. Alcohol is al kohl K O H L. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, they a, distilled. it's a it's a it's a Arabic word. Yeah, they um, because they would use it as medicine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they and came up with the technology of distilling to make alcohol. Yeah, Does that makes sense. And algebra. And algebra, right? Algebra. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, the word sherry comes from the Moorish word for hareth. Yeah. In this area. Yeah. That's super interesting. Yeah. So there's a, a bunch of real fun information that I'll throw up on the Patreon stuff. Um, found some fun facts. Kind of breaks down uh, all of all of the bits and pieces about why sherry is the way it is. I love sherry. I'm so glad we did a sherry day. I want to drink more sherry this summer. Port, also fermented, is fortified while it's fermenting to stop fermentation. Port. Port. Okay. However. Sherry. Sherry ferments completely before being fortified so all the grape sugars get turned into alcohol oh which is the question i asked earlier does it is it fortified after After. fermentation and yes sherry is fortified fortified after fermentation yep Yep, yep, yep. i learned so much my brain it hurts yep 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 there's a lot of information that will be available to all the people on the patreon on the patreon yeah so anyway Thank you. Get yourself a sherry. Get yourself some tapas. Sit on the deck. Sign up for Patreon. Oh, yeah. Come to our party. But you have to email us. You have to email us and get a ticket. And, and there you are... get 20. Like, there, there's only 20 tickets. And you, believe you me, amazing. Yeah. It's going to be a good time. Yeah. It's our mimosa meet and greet. Mimosa meet and greet. <laughs> Jazz hands. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. And always take two bottles. Bye-bye. Ciao.